Welcome back, everyone. Um, we have this incredible panel discussion today on creating transformational change to ensure equitable student learning and success. Just a friendly reminder, if you have any questions for our speakers, please add your questions to the Q&A box. On our panel, we have Dr. Susan D. Bloom, who has broadened our perspective of teaching and learning with books entitled, I Love Learning, I Hate School, and Ungrading, Why Reading Students Undermines Learning and What to Do Instead. Dr. Shamani Dias, Director of the Preparing Future Faculty Institute at Claremont Graduate University, whom I've had the personal pleasure of learning from directly. And let me tell you, she practices what she preaches. Her course on transdisciplinary pedagogy changed my entire look on teaching and learning. And finally, Sudi Whelan, Technical Assistance Consultant with the American Institutes for Research is a champion for supporting faculty to be in community, to do this incredibly meaningful work through communities of practice. And so without further ado, we will first hear from our first speaker, Dr. Susan D. Bloom. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen and hope that it works the way it's supposed to. Um, our semester hasn't started yet, so I'm, I haven't been doing as many presentations in the last month or two as I was um, for the last, um, many, many months. I've been teaching remotely for about a year now. I just want to thank you for the invitation to um, speak with you. It's really exciting to see all the thoughtful work that people in community colleges are doing. Obviously, I don't have to tell you how important your work is, but it's something that I'm really awed by. So I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, the plan is in 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to kind of follow up on where our last speaker left off or one of the implications he suggested was that we really need to think about good teaching. And my the bottom line is that I think grades have a role to play in good teaching. And by grades, I mean no grades or ungrading. So I'm going to present why grades don't do good things, why grades do bad things, um, what we should do instead, and what the results are. I, I have green trees as the background because I think we all need a little extra soothing these days. So I hope that it calms you down just like the music did in the interlude. So um, I'm inspired by Bell Hooks, who reminds us that the classroom is where the radical action takes place. This is where we actually practice freedom, although we don't usually. So how can we practice freedom for this kind of lighting the fire of learning? How do we create confident learners? And I'm going to suggest that it's not the way we usually do things. I also want us to keep in mind, and I obviously don't have time in my time to address this, that we are not talking about some sort of generic learner. We're talking about human beings. And then that's more important than their learning, which is more important than their performance. So this is just a kind of values equation that I like to keep in mind. But why am I going to suggest that grades aren't doing the good things and are doing bad things and that we should do something instead. Here we go. So grades do many things, but, and I can't go into all the research for all of this right now, but they don't do what we often assume they do. So they don't actually motivate or they don't motivate in any ways that we desire. There are rooms full of studies about this going back 100 years. Some of the names you might have heard of are Ryan and Desi talking about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Alfie Cohn has digested all this research and he has made it really, really accessible in his books. It's Cohn, K-O-H-N, um, in his masterpiece, Punished by rewards or a short, shorter piece that you can get online called From Degrading to Degrading. And he did us the honor of writing the foreword to our book. Um, but grades don't increase intrinsic motivation. They only 
give a kind of coercion, which is exactly what we're used to, but not what we're trying to accomplish if we want confident, joyous, engaged learners. Grades also don't communicate. We think they do. Sometimes the assumption is that students need to know how they're doing and the grades tell them, or that other teachers or employers or other institutions of education need to know. But in fact, for a hundred years, people have been demonstrating that grades are completely inconsistent and really unreliable. They give a kind of false precision. And a hundred years ago, Starch and Elliot did three studies. They, they gave people, they gave educators examples of student work in English, history, and math. And they said, okay, grade this. And what they found was these professional practicing teachers varied from, let's say, a, a D to an A on um, how they thought the student work measured up. That's been replicated since then. And we know the grades don't actually communicate with the precision that we um, attribute to them. Further, they, they are in some ways arbitrary because different educators and different systems and different subjects include different measures. So I, this is going to be a really fast um, kind of whimsical um, view of what grades communicate about they communicate about mastery, timeliness, format, um, effort, improvement, participation, engagement, attendance, extroversion, preparation, interest, financial security, of course, and freedom from excessive care. Those are some of the things that you find when you actually um, look at what people are grading for. They don't say it's about security, but there was, for instance, um, back in March at the beginning of the pandemic when almost all schools went remote, suddenly the New York Times had a story about two students from the same course. One of them went home, this was not a community college, but one student went home to her family's second house in Maine and finished her course from there. The other one went to her family's food truck in Florida and worked to support her family. Needless to say, one of them was probably better able to keep up with the course the other one. And so if we are measuring people against all the same um, outcomes, we're, we're not really looking at learning, we're looking at a whole bunch of other things. We know that grades don't promote deep and meaningful learning. As Alfie Cohn says in the foreword to our book, the more their attention is directed to how well they're doing, the less engaged they tend to be with what they're doing. So many of us have heard students saying over and over again, what do you want? Is this right? What do I have to do? How many pages? What, how many sources? What's the font? What's the spacing? They're not focused on what they're doing. They're focused on pleasing me. And in some ways that detracts, in lots of ways that detracts from what we're um, trying to accomplish. Grades don't promote equity, even though they appear to be providing sameness. But as we know, sameness is not equity. Sameness is a kind of violence because we know our students aren't all the same. So we have this kind of platonic model this is not actually how it works, but we have this platonic model that we have a student, a generic student, and they take the class and there are certain learning outcomes which generate a grade. But instead, it's, the reality is much more like this. We have students with all different backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, different linguistic backgrounds, different ages, different economic situations, different health, different abilities, different transportation, different citizenship status. We have all these different situations. And even in the same semester, some are working full time, some have care responsibilities, some uh, they're, they're experiencing even the same semester in different ways. So the outcome, their goals are different. 
One might be taking a course because they're interested. One might be taking it because they're forced to. So everything about the students is different. So the outcomes are different too. And that's as it should be. If you take seriously the idea of universal design for learning, then obviously everybody's learning differently. But if you evaluate them on the same exact measure, you're not really producing equity. Another thing we know is grades do a lot of bad things. <laughs> grades definitely lead to gaming the system. So if the goal is the grade and the points, then it's rational to do what it takes to get the points. There's a book that was published 50 years ago called What You Get? The Grading Game in American Education by Kirschenbaum, Simon, and Napier. It's actually just being reissued as we speak um, with a new edition, by, with a new um, introduction by Barry Fishman. And basically, nothing has changed in 50 years, except more people are gaming the system and the stakes are probably higher. But gaming the system is a direct outcome of grades, which also encourage cheating because you want to do as little as possible to get the grade. So cheating seems rational. And I wrote a book about this. So I, I'm not advocating teach, cheating. I'm not saying that cheating is a good thing, but I'm saying that it's an, a direct outcome of a focus on grades. Grades reduce or destroy intrinsic motivation. This is connected to all the research on the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Nobody has to pay us to eat ice cream unless we're ice cream tasters, in which case we probably dread eating ice cream eventually. But most of us do a lot of things that we like for the joy. And the fact is humans like other mammals are um, great learners. We are driven by curiosity, but school often kind of diminishes that. Another thing grades do that we don't really want is they promote competition among students rather than cooperation. And especially if there's a curve, which um, I don't know if your courses mandate, but in some departments, some colleges, some disciplines, a curve is mandated. If you want to see some of the research against that, there's a really wonderful article from 2017 by Shinsky and Tanner called Teaching More by Writing Less. And they teach in STEM fields and they argue that our idea of normed abilities is really flawed and does not lead to what we're hoping for, which is robust learning. Grades also finally um, constitute the principal source of students' academic anxiety. So if you ask students, what are you worried about? Obviously they're worried about paying the rent and they're worried about feeding their children and they're worried about getting the car fixed and they're worried about COVID and they're worried about their kids and their parents. And there are lots and lots of real life worries, but in terms of academic anxiety, grades are usually the primary focus. Teachers also don't like grades very much. If you ask faculty, what's the part of your job you like the least? For most faculty, it's the grades. Okay, so maybe I've convinced you that grades are problematic. So what do we do instead? So here's where um, I come in. So I'm a proponent and a practitioner of ungrading. So ungrading basically just means not focused, focusing the course on grading. And this can be small or total. In my own courses, I go for total ungrading until the end of the semester when I'm obliged to produce a final grade for the course. But even if you aren't as radical as I am, um, or maybe you're not uh, able to do it or you're not in as privileged a situation as I am with tenure and so forth, um, there can still be lots of ungraded activities. So lots of interesting, intriguing, meaningful assignments connected to where the students' interests are. Things can be fun and educational, obviously. Um, there can be lots of these sorts of things. The feedback could come from 
other students. The professor, the teacher isn't the only person who can produce feedback. I myself have gone to total ungrading, um, which for me means focusing on these four dimensions. So I'm focused on learning, on student choices, on authenticity, and on reflection and feedback. So learning, obviously, everybody thinks they're focused on learning, but often grades also focus on compliance or effort or time spent or challenge. and Sometimes learning requires effort, but it doesn't always. Um, if you're learning language as a child, you're not, um, nobody's drilling you, nobody's evaluating every mistake. And we know that mistakes are necessary for learning. So if we're averaging mistakes into our grades, we're punishing people for learning. So if we keep in mind this principle that learning is really what it's all about, that can help a little bit. But one of the other things we know is humans benefit from having choices. Um, Self-determination theory and psychology tells us that in, there are lots of places where we know that choices make students feel like they have a kind of power, which is what we're trying to do. We want their education to empower them so they can go forth from our classrooms, whether it's to the next level of education or whether it's to a job or whether it's to life. We know that humans are learning all the time. And so we want to give them the sense that they know how to make choices, that if you're going to try to persuade your landlord not to evict you, what is the best way to do it? Nobody's imposing a multiple choice test on you. So how do you decide what genre is the best one to use? If students practice making choices in school, they will have this experience as they go forward. Another dimension of um, this focus on um, student on real learning is authenticity where for let's say writing, there's an actual audience. So students aren't only writing for the teacher, they're also writing for somebody else. So Kathy Davidson, for instance, who's written widely about education was an English teacher when she began and she had her students write job application letters. And her, she was teaching them writing and the students certainly cared about spelling and they certainly cared about conventions of letter writing because the stakes were really high. There is a lot of reflection in courses that don't have grades because it's really important for all of us as adults to reflect on our practices and figure out, is this good? Is this good enough? Is this accomplishing the goal without waiting always to be told by somebody else? Oh yeah, that's that's good, that's not good. So like athletes and artists, honest um, looking at people's work develops metacognition. That includes self-assessment on assignments. I've now gone to a single point rubric rather than a detailed rubric. You're either there or you still need some work. I used to do what probably most people do when they begin with a rubric is I had like four categories, excellent, pretty good, you know, or exceeds expectations, meets expectations, not quite meeting expectations, but students translate that into a grade. If you ask them, are you there yet or not quite there yet? They're much more likely to be honest, especially if there's no grade and there's no game in the system. So this is a conversation where we're all on the same team and our goals are the same, which are improvement. And that includes feedback, not only from me, the teacher, but from others in their community of learners. So there, when you develop a community, and that was part of the previous presentation also, some kind of sense of the social nature of learning together, because we all have that. That's what we're doing right now, right? We're developing a kind of community. So we have people we can turn to. And that happens also. Um, in my courses, I ask students for reflection on major assignments. And then we have 
portfolio conferences. I, I used to try to do it at the beginning, middle, and end of the semester. That was kind of a lot. Um, I've, I was inspired by Star Saxstein to reduce these meetings to five minutes each. She's a high school teacher. And if the students are doing a lot of reflecting and they've accumulated their portfolio, then they can talk to me briefly about what they think their grade should be. I know that's always the question, how do I develop grades? The students suggest their grade. They say, what do you think their grade should be? And they, they say, well, based on what I've learned, based on what I've produced, based on my goals, I believe I've earned a B plus. Not every student says, even in my high achieving university, not every student believes they have earned an A in every course. So the results of this have been transformative for me. My students are happier, I'm happier. Um, I have much better relations with my students. They still learn a lot. They are, they say explicitly sometimes, for the first time I learned for myself instead of learning for the grade. And for me, that's, um, that's what we're after. So I've edited this book on ungrading. It has chapters, five chapters from people in K through 12 because they have spent the most time thinking about pedagogy. Alfie Cohn, as I said, honored us with writing the foreword. There are STEM teachers, there are community college teachers, there's a community college organic chemistry teacher in this book, um, there's a math teacher. So I, I think this is happening now, there's a movement and I encourage you to question your traditional practices and if you really are committed to learning try ungrading at least a little bit and see what happens. So thank you. And I look forward to our discussion and listening, learning from the rest of our um, speakers today. So thank thank you. you so much, Dr. Bloom. I see all this incredible just comments in the chat and these gr great questions, just folks thinking this is extraordinary. It's amazing. It's some, I'm certainly inspired. Um, we're gonna just ask one brief question of you um, after each speaker and then we'll open it up for Q&A um, after all we hear from everyone. But I guess this one question I would ask is, what would you say to faculty who think that some learners are so used to grades as a measure of their success that they wouldn't know how they're doing in the class if they don't get a grade or they may not be inspired to complete the learning activities if they're not graded? We have to have conversations with them. If they're not completing, like I've stopped really punishing students for non-completion, but I am keeping track, especially during the pandemic. And you know, if students aren't attending or if they aren't engaging or if they aren't completing the work, I wanna know what's happening. Like, what is going on? Are you not interested? Are you sick? Are you, like, are you homeless? What is happening and how can I help? So that I, I might want to know that but in order to help them, not to punish them. And how students are doing, um, if they're learning and they know they're learning and they can do the next work, then I think they are getting authentic messages about how they're learning rather than this kind of artificial message that says, this is a B plus, you know? Um, and if, and also I give feedback. Um, I give, I've gone to audio feedback for major assignments, like one minute, just like, this was exciting. This was, um, you might next time want to think about this. And I loved reading it. It moved me. I cried. I mean, I, last semester, my students' work was so amazing. I literally cried over and over again. Students wrote song. I gave them all kinds of choices. So the authentic learning was absolutely um, motivating my plan for the class and they really took me up on it. But yes, you're right. Students aren't familiar with this. And, you know, you should see what high achieving students at selective schools think about grades. You know, they think that's like their birthright, um, but they actually are relaxed. They, it's taken me a few years to figure out how to put them at ease and, um, 
but they really do appreciate it because they understand they trust me and I trust them. And we have genuine interactions and conversations and they see that the focus is really on them as a human being who is trying to learn. And it, it takes some tweaking. It's, it's not instant and you can't just do everything you used to do, like have tests and things and not give a grade. You, you may have to rethink a lot of the dimensions of the course. Thank you so much. It's so insightful. And it seems like if you're not as bogged down by trying to assign a grade, you would have more time to connect with students on that level. So thank you so much, Dr. Bloom. Look forward to hearing more from you later today. Now um, it's time to hear from our next speaker, Dr. Shamani Diaz. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, and I'm really, really glad to be here. I'm going to share some slides. And um, uh, Dr. Bloom, you really laid the ground for a very important conversation. And I hope that what I'm going to talk about with multiliteracies um, builds on that, takes from that, and connects with that so that we can have a really good conversation after. So let me share my slides right now. Um, Oops, okay. All right. So, oh, wait. There we go. My computer's acting up a little today. It's a bit sluggish. So, um, I, you know, actually, I want to say before I launch into the slides that um, at the Preparing Future Faculty Program at Claremont Graduate University, we use that book on grading. We love it. Um, and uh, it is very transgressive. Uh, graduate students are, um, you know, they're, they're trying to learn how to teach. They feel very, very, um, you know, going into teaching for the first time, especially if you're adjuncting. Um, so that book is helping them find some solid ground with taking a very different approach to assessment. And what I want to talk about today is something that um, would has helped us create some pathways into thinking about assessment in a very different way uh, to disrupt, to transgress a little bit, um, and that's multiliteracies. So um, I want to start with this model. We've all probably seen different versions of this everywhere. But um, what we're trying to do is move away from that transmission model of education, which is from an industrial production economy from a time that had, a, you know, there was a hegemonic kind of filtering that excluded many learners. Um, and especially as you see, if you saw in um, Dr. Bloom's presentation, assessment and grading and the harm that it can do. And what we want to do is move in all ways, in all aspects of education to this engagement model where it's built on the idea of co-creation, choice, students having authority, where we invite and honor all that rich, um, all the rich minds, identities, histories, um, the diversity that our students bring. And part of the reason also that when, when I get to talking about multiliteracies that this matters so much is because we're not just teaching students for you know our class this semester we're teaching them to flourish in their future you know so it's it's a it's a big thing that we are trying to to journey together with our students you know as a road into their future and so the question is how do you do it and I want to begin with this, so just for a moment, take a guess what you think this is. Okay, here we go. This is the map of the internet. And, um, you know, so this is our world. And I love this as a metaphor because I think that it represents the, the complex space in which we live. And it has a lot to do with communication, with connection, information. This is our, what you know has been called for a long time the information and knowledge economy. So many of the qualities of this world, it's always shifting and changing milliseconds. It's decentered. It's 
interconnected, but also very diverse. You know, and for some people, that's a huge paradox. And the big question that comes up for us with this is, so if this is the world into which our students are gonna go, um, what abilities must we nurture for them to flourish in this kind of a world defined by this flux and change the whole time and defined and shaped by how we use information and knowledge. And this is where multiliteracies might be a very useful concept, right? Um, you're thinking of, you know, the old idea of literacy, teaching our students to read and write, right? And um, as you heard in the previous presentation, there are so many ways, genres, discourses, worlds of uh, literacies. And so multiliteracies as a, as a concept is opening it up to all the different modalities, forms, uh, discourse universes, both analog and digital, right? And on, on the right, you just see a short list of them. But more than that, in using these different modalities, multiliteracies is not just the read, write, comprehension. It is about all these processes that you see in the word cloud, connect, compare, contrast, curate, select, what is a bias, what's a perspective, explore. And so there could be a lot of fostering of this curiosity to enter into this world, of the joy of being able to navigate this world and to communicate and create in this world. And what multiliteracies does is support the engagement model uh, of learning. And one of the things that's really important, and I was so excited to see the bell hooks quote, is because it is uh, an incredibly, you know, in technology, it's a disruptive technology, you know, it disrupts an old paradigm, it transgresses. Um, but in that disruption and transgression, we are allowing our students to take center stage in their own lives. And that's really a big part for me of liberatory education. Um, so I want to I want to jump in. I have three little frameworks that I want uh, frames rather uh, ways of looking um, to interrogate our traditional or what I call legacy assessments. So very quickly, what are some typical legacy assessments in your discipline, and what feelings come up for you? We heard a lot about this, and for your students, right, in the last presentation, and what might pop into your mind might be some of these things. Right. And what I have learned in, in my own research, in the work I do with students, is how traumatizing grading and a, just the word assessment is. And it can go for decades. You know, people have been harmed by this. And why do we do it? When learning, you think of a child learning is so filled with joy. Right. They lose it. Where? Why? Because they go to school. <laughs> Um, here's a second frame, a perspective to see from what is the connection for you between assessment and inequities? Um, and which students typically do not perform? And when you think about it, what are the assumptions behind this traditional legacy assessment approach? Um, and some of it, you know, is that the one size fits all. Everybody's going to do the same thing. Input, passive reception, output. Or that uh, performance is an indicator of learning. But you know, that student who didn't do well in my class, was it really because of what I call borrowing from public health, social determinants of learning? This is what we're measuring, not actually learning. That student who did really, really well in the test, was it because they we are measuring privilege? So, there is a real inherent problem in the logic of assessment that we need to start really uh, embracing and thinking about. And then this is really important, this third frame, which is why we measure, why we do this uh, assessment. The first two, summative and formative assessment, we're measuring. And, I, and then the next three, we're supporting learning to empower learners to foster metacognition, learning how to learn, to make learning mean, meaningful. So the joy, the curiosity, the relevance, the application of learning to their own lives. And if you stop and think about it, when you think of the word assessment, do you see that balance? You know, which do you see more of? And even with the first two, do we see more summative? How much formative work is happening? And really, 
in the realm of how we think about assessment, how much of the number three, four, and five are coming into play. So I feel like in many ways, when I look at assessment, we've lost the balance completely. Now, we, we heard yesterday quite a lot, all students can learn. But the question is, how do we radically change assessments? How do we transgress this realm uh, to really support learning so that we're fostering the learning that is based on the students' own selves, their lives, their lived experiences? How do we empower in meaningful and joyful ways? And how do we then truly activate that engagement model of learning so that we truly become more congruent with the kind of world in which we live and we're preparing our students for. So back to multiliteracies as a reminder, just to sum up that um, this is a way of um, moving assessment to the engagement model. This will help us address inequities inherent in the assumptions and practices of legacy assessments. This puts students' voices and capacity building for the future for the world in which they're going to live. And I feel like that's a really important thing that we need to give so much attention to these days. This puts it in the middle and it also fosters a really deep learning. There's a lot of room when you use multiliteracies for flexibility and choice, for um, the students own, you know, we empower them, we give them authority to, to think about who they are, what their goals are, and how they communicate with the world and with each other. You know, a lot of assessment doesn't do that, as Dr. Bloom talked about, right? It just is compliance. Uh, I've done it, check, 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 right? But we really want to move the world of assessment into this space of the deeper learning. And I don't think it's just learning subject matter, you know, it's learning it's human development. It's learning how to be. And when you think, I've often thought about this and I did a little bit of research on you know, how many hours, waking hours of an individual's life is spent in a formal classroom space, is spent in outside of classroom space doing formal classroom related work. It's a huge percentage of your life. And if most of that time of your waking hours is not given, it, it's, it's just given to compliance, as opposed to that student who shared for the first time I learned for myself, right? What a loss of our human potential is happening for millions of people in the world. So I feel like giving that back to students is so important because it is allowing it's humanizing education. Um, and, and so, you know, this is just a short list, a partial list of some of the benefits of using, beginning to work with multiliteracies as educators. It in itself builds in all of this authentic, inclusive um, pathways. It connects with students' own lived experiences. When you use multiliteracies, we give them that openness, that choice. It interacts with larger world texts. We destroy the dominance of the textbook. We say that one story that the textbook tells is not the only story, right? We can decolonize our discourse uh, universes more easily. It brings agency and meaningfulness. And most of all, we can actually truly engage in co-created teaching and learning between us and our students, between our students and their peers. And I think in my practice, I've noticed how well it allows you to integrate UDL, to bring in uh, open educational resources so that it's not just patchwork, you know, little bandaid, oh, I'm doing a little bit of UDL here. It's integral to an approach to teach and learn. So then it goes beyond just like, how do I assess a person? It goes into, how do I design the whole teaching and learning thing where assessment is just an integral, natural part of the dance of teaching and learning? Um, 
I want to give you some, um, a few examples um, and then a resource. So this was done in a statistics class. And, you know, they're learning stats, descriptive stats, correlations, regressions, all of those good things. But what they did was students worked in teams or pairs. They went out and they picked an issue or a, a thing that they cared deeply about, music, the environment, some kind of social issue. And they went out and found the data. So this is the, the opening up into all the different literacies that they could go out and explore and, and learn along the way, uh, different sources, different perspectives. They found the data, they did all of that, the consolidation, the comparison, the putting together, and then they presented it in the format that played to their strengths, right? Um, in this particular one, they, they had a community presentation, so they had a real audience, so they deeply, deeply cared how it all came together. And it was amazing. Now, as at the end of the semester, of course, they did the usual test, you know, sit down, multiple choice, short answer test. But bringing this into the center of the course was a way of learning and assessing themselves and assessing how they are doing. Um, the balance was there. This was learning and formative assessment that really empowered the students. Um, here's another example from history um, in rhetoric and writing. So in a history class, um, both of these did a pretty similar thing. They um, again worked in teams. Now, this is rich for that collaborative development and picked something. They, this was a historical event. They were exploring uh, the great wars of the 20th century, but they got their evidence, their data, their information from multiple perspectives. Poetry, not just historical archives, art. Um, and then they could present in any format again. Same thing with the rhetoric and writing, you know, finding different genres, different perspectives, and they had to curate and um, create. And in all of this, there's a huge joyful creative process where they had to think about the form and the, the modality in which they wanted to share what they had developed and found out. So it's this huge amount of pride that comes into this as well. And the intrinsic motivation uh, was there because there was so much flexibility. Um, there was, you know, there are deadlines and timelines. And when I do this kind of work, because I have a theater background, I talk about the development work, the uh, devising work, and then we are rehearsing. And then there is, you know, performance day. And so we have to be ready. And that model, uh, allows a lot of flexibility for all the different life circumstances to get worked out. There's a lot of negotiation that goes on. So this approach to assessment bleeds beyond assessment, flows out into just how we design the learning process. Um, I wanted, uh, there is a document that when you get the slides, uh, you can download. This is just a simple list of a starter list I call of, you know, different modalities and ways of going about assignments, assessments and activities and uh, some ideas for that. And if I've interested you in multiliteracies, here's a really good uh, short list of some wonderful things to read and work that's being done in this, this area of multiliteracies. So I'll, I'll end here, and I hope that I've given you uh, food for thought and questions that we can get into when with this, uh, with the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm just uh, getting flashbacks from our summer class, which was incredible. I recommend everyone go through the Preparing Future Faculty Institute <laughs> at Claremont Graduate University. I do have a question for you. And by the way, you're just getting so many kudos about the examples because theory, it's theory and action, right? It's not just the theory behind it, but like, how does this actually play out in real life? So just wanna say, it's totally appreciate that. I have one question for you before we move on to our next uh, speaker. And that is how can institutions support the type of reflection and interrogation of assessment and measurement that you've outlined today? Okay, uh, two things. One is uh, we have more power in our classrooms than we realize. Um, 
and and the small, you know, I call it edging in, and um, the way Dr. Bloom talked about, you know, the little bit or go whole whole way in, we can edge in um, doing a little bit of this, and if you don't have that, you know, you're not protected by tenure, you're adjuncting and so on, um, or a new faculty member. There, you can do more than we, we can always do more than we think. And I know this from experience. I have always done, run the risk of ask forgiveness later and just dub things. But the number of times where nobody's ever queried it is overwhelming, you know? So we can, you can bring this in in small ways, a little project, you know, uh, do a little bit of ungrading, do a little bit of multiliteracies, bring it in in a little bit. You may still have to do the end of semester summative thing because you have to submit grades um, using portfolios and, and just saying, I'll just, you know, have a conversation and then we'll think of a grade together, co-creating grades. The second thing is that this is part of, I think of teachers as quiet activists. Our world of the classroom is our activation space and our activism space. But then once you can, if you can, look for opportunities to know the research and to speak to it at any kind of forum that you have an opportunity to be. So to also be the advocate if you sit on a committee. I know that this is the ground up way it works, but I do feel that we are no longer alone. Look at us here at a symposium. We have each other and knowing that people doing this gives you courage gives you strength. Um, and so I'm not saying it's easy, but I do feel we have more pathways than we know that we should be looking out for and go for it. Ask forgiveness later. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Dias. So now it's time to hear from Sudi Whalen. Um, and it's such a beautiful transition because um, Dr. Dice is talking about all this incredible work and that we're not alone. And I feel like Sudi's going to talk a little bit more about how we can come together to do this meaningful work. Thank you so much. I literally just wrote down what she said. We're not alone we uh, and we have each other. Like that's got to be the mantra for 2021. I feel like as we move forward in this work, thank you so much for saying that Dr. Dias. And I also um, really, I wrote multiple notes because there are so many great things that between Dr. Dias and Dr. Bloom that stated, um, stated that really lends themselves to faculty collaboration. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have just a couple of slides. Um, and if you were in my session, yesterday, you probably heard some of this, but the group by and large wasn't all in the room. So I want to make sure that we're all talking about this collaboration and moving forward together. Um, when we talk about those big ideas of faculty learning communities, we're not talking about like brand new concepts that don't exist. Remember faculty learning communities were on college campuses in the 1960s and the 1970s before learning communities were in K-12, we were doing it on college campuses first, right? And so we're trying to bring that movement back to where it was before, where it really originated, where that heart and soul of educator collaboration really began. And so when we think about those big ideas and what that really means. I really loved what um, Dr. Bloom said earlier when she mentioned that different grades and different systems don't align. And I would push that a little bit further to say that do those grades in our own campuses even align? And beyond that, do we even know what that means for our students, right? And so when we come together as learning communities, we shift the focus from the grade, we shift the focus from simple compliance to we're focusing intentionally on learning. We're focusing intentionally on collaboration and we're really focusing intentionally on results. And when we're talking about results, I don't just mean they passed the class, they graduated and they're marked as you know part of those graduation statistics. I mean, we can look at those results of what the student learning, the evidence of student learning, the things that they can do, the knowledge and skills they acquired, and we can look further past that and see that the evidence of that learning is students who are prepared for workforce, students who are prepared to go into the next level of education, not just to who got the A in the class and have that piece of paper, but then they get to the next level and they're not really ready. And so as educators who are in these classrooms with the students, we are in the position to really get to focus on 
these specific things, right? And so I keep seeing in the conversation in the chat, you know, what, what about these large classes? What if I have 200, 250 plus students? We're talking about, and I really love that Dr. Diaz said this earlier, that disruption. We're talking about systemic change. We're talking about systemic disruption. We're talking about changing the way we do business so we can better serve students. And that means that we have that bubbling up from the bottom and trickling down from the top distributive leadership where we're making shifting, changing, and going in both directions at all times so that we can make this better for our students. So that means that sometimes we have to look at our class sizes and say, can we really serve our students to the best of our ability if I have 250 students? Those are really hard conversations we have to have, but we have to be willing to do the best we can for our students. And that means looking at the way we allocate funding, looking at the way we distribute our leadership, looking at the way class um, uh, classrooms are established and how are assigned, looking at the way teachers collaborate together and the time that they're allowed to have together. That means bringing adjunct faculty to the table because they're doing a lot of this heavy lifting and work in terms of educating students, but they're not often included in the conversation. And it means supporting faculty. It means supporting faculty to empower them to do the investigative work that is needed to really serve our students. So when we get further to the idea of focusing on learning, um, we're not just talking about learning of just the student. We're talking about learning for ourselves, for students, for faculty, and for the institution as a whole. Um, in the book I talked about yesterday, A New Way by Eker and Sells, when we talk about learning communities, this is what they had to say about that. I just thought this was so such a great quote that the goal is that, F, that each graduating class learns more than the previous graduating class. In other words, we envision the institution itself as a learner. Over time, it continuously learns how to produce more learning with each graduating class. We're not saying we're producing higher scores. We're not saying that, you know, we're getting higher grades and all these students are graduating. And we, you know, we have that feather in our cap. No, we're saying we're producing more learning, that our students are doing better at each year after year after year. And that means that we're looking at ourselves. We're looking at our practice. We're looking at the data that supports our practice. And we're evaluating, you know, not just those summative assessments, but also formative assessments. And when I say formative assessments, I'm including those classroom activities, that project-based learning, that problem-based learning, all these things that help us know, did the student really get it, right? I'm not just talking about that essay they wrote or that multiple choice quiz that they were able to respond to, but that real evidence that they not only learned it, but can apply it. And that's a little bit harder to do. It takes a lot more time and effort. I get that. I know. We're not saying this is going to be the easiest work in the world. What we do as educators is so important that we can't afford to take the easy way out. We have to really investigate our practices as we're moving in and as we're doing this work. So then we look at the other big ideas, this focus on collaborative teams. We're talking about, I'm talking about a structure of an intentional embedded collaboration in which faculty gets to come together and peer review what each other is doing, talking about our work, talking about our challenges, trusting each other enough to know that you care about my students the same way I care about my students because they're all our students and asking each other the hard questions, which is how can I as an educator do better? How can I learn more? How can I be a lifelong, lifelong learner and encourage my students to be lifelong learners? And how do we learn together and grow together? We really let these communities be led by faculty and focused on students. But that's not to say leadership can't be involved or shouldn't be involved. Leadership has to be involved because teachers can't do this work without support. If they don't have the resources, the time, the funding, or just the autonomy to do these things, then it, does, it falls flat in the water. So we have to give them the support that they need in order to really lift these boats up. Like they say that rising tide raises all boats. I say that all the time because it does. If we're all working together and holding hands and agreeing on what our students need to have to succeed, and we're really focusing on how to do that to the best of our ability for each student, not saying we're giving every student the same thing, but saying we're going to meet each student where they are and get them to where they need to be. We also have to make sure that these teams and these that are coming together are sharing the responsibility of student learning, that we're not just assigning to everybody else, this is what you have to do, this is how you have to teach it, and this is the way you need to do it, but bringing them to the table to really evaluate and investigate their own work and practice together. That sometimes means that the teachers who are not included in the conversation need to be brought to the table because those teachers who are adjunct part-time faculty, who aren't always able to come to the meetings, who aren't paid to attend certain things, they're still 
still teaching in those classrooms. They're still teaching students. We need them to succeed just as much as we need tenured faculty to, to succeed. So we need to be making sure that all teachers are supported, not just the ones that we know are the rock stars that do great jobs and do great things, but those little bright lights that often go unrecognized and unnoticed need to be also be included. And we need to give teachers an opportunity to learn from one another and build each other up. I can be the most awesome teacher in the world in my field and think I'm so great. And I always have space to learn from other faculty members, from other educators. And so bringing teachers together to give them the opportunity to do that really helps them grow. And then when that third big idea, and I know this is going to be sound so controversial, but at the end of the day, it's not about our happiness and what makes us feel warm and fuzzy and everything that's great. Research tells us that we know that collaborative teams make for happier and more motivated faculty, which is great, but that's not the primary focus of the learning community. The primary focus is learning, and it's the learning of our students and being able to assure that students are learning, being able to assure that students are meeting those outcomes that we're saying that they're meeting, right? So if that does require somewhat of a bit of a paradigm shift from the intention. We we're really hoping our students are getting this. This is what we're saying that they're gonna get. I'm pretty sure they got an A, so I'm almost positive they got it, to actually looking at results. What is the evidence that the students actually understood it and can apply it? And that is a little bit of a mindset shift. And then we're talking about having giving teams meaningful improvement goals and letting them establish those. Right? Those teachers who are in the classroom, those faculty members who are looking at their students on a weekly or daily basis, who are you know, looking at those grades and assessments and everything else, those are the ones who actually know, those are what we call, I'm former military, the boots on the ground. They know what's happening with these students, right? And so we need to give them an opportunity to identify where those gaps are, set goals to meet those gaps and the steps it takes to align with those goals, right? But that also means that faculty has to communicate with administration and administration has to communicate with faculty as well, because it's both responsibilities, both directions, to assure that we're, we're sharing and we're meeting the, the institution's mission, vision, goals, commitments, all these things, and that we are all aligning in what we're hoping to happen with our students. Sometimes that does mean revisiting what our mission and our vision really is, because if we're not meeting it, maybe we need to evaluate, do we need to rephrase it? We also make sure that team members in these communities hold one another mutually accountable for results. When we're talking about having these um, groups being faculty led, that's not to say that they are completely out on their own and there's no accountability whatsoever. There has to be accountability. We have to have expectations for what we want faculty to be able to do. And I really loved um, the comment that was made earlier about the difficulty people have in getting these things to happen on union campuses. But if you bring the unions to the table, then you get the opportunity to actually do better Better, right. And so what we see is that when we bring faculty and people that have those, that kind of influence with faculty to the table and ask them, what are the needs? What, what can we do? And involve them in that. We move a lot farther than we do when we just say, this is what's going to happen and make it a top down approach. So then the last thing I want to get to here is the, the question of, are we putting students first? Um, Eker and Cells challenge us to move beyond Darwinian culture in terms of colleges and the survival of the fittest that you know we want to make sure the best student is the one that finishes and they you know they fight to the very end no we need to get to the point that we give students the time and the assistance and the access that they need to succeed and that means that every student doesn't need the exact same thing i will go so step far, a step further to argue that we do this without reducing rigor by bringing the level of rigor down or saying that we don't need to be as hard and needs to be less difficult rigor doesn't necessarily mean difficulty it means we're covering all areas, right? And I, we're not gonna reduce the rigor in order to make sure students can succeed. Instead, we're gonna give students what they need to meet that rigorous level. If we bring the level and the, and the requirement down, that's not equity, that doesn't support anyone. If we say, okay, if we lower our standards, the, all the students will be more likely to succeed. Yeah, our, our statistics will look so much better, but these students will be no better prepared than they were before. And the goal isn't for us to look good on paper. The goal is for us to produce students who really are, can succeed, who can exit our campuses and go to the next level of education or get a job and earn a sustainable wage so that they're not struggling later, right? That's why we do this. Um, and so that means that we have to actually lead 
some form of cultural change in order for this to happen, right? That means that there's not gonna be a one size fits all approach. And the reason for that is because all these campuses are different. What's happening on your campus is very, even here in the state of California, what's happening at Mount San Antonio College is not the same thing that's happening at LACCD. The needs of faculty at LACCD may not be the same as the needs of faculty at Las Madonnas College. These things change and the, and the demographics are different from one area to the, to the other. What's happening on your campuses in terms of faculty collaboration is different from one area to the other. So you have to look at where faculty is and bring them along and, and, and provide what they need in order to establish actual collaborative teams and communities. Um, that's just how it is. But that means you have to do the investigative work of figuring out where is my faculty, right? I've talked to a couple of people over the past year or so who are doing a lot of really great work in terms of faculty collaboration within California. And there are some schools that are so much farther along and there are some that aren't. And so that means that you have to look at where you are now and figure out, do I have the funding available? Have I provided the time needed? And do we have the structures in place that our faculty can come together? And if that's not the case, that means we have to figure out what we need to do to make it happen to support faculty collaboration. Thus requires effective leadership. It's really unreasonable to assume that any kind of influencing any kind of change on campus is going to happen without the support of faculty and staff, but it also doesn't work well if leadership is not invested or involved, if faculty is not empowered, if they are not given the autonomy, if they're not given the resources that's, that are needed for this kind of systemic change. So that means we have to have what we call a simultaneously loose and tight kind of culture. That means we are loose enough to allow faculty to lead the direction of their team, would you know, maintain academic freedom, if you will, but we're tight enough to assure faculty are, again, aligning with our mission, vision, values, goals, and commitments, and we're loose on the approach. In other words, how the faculty chooses to address this and how they work together and what they come up with as the experimentation they want to try, that we need to give them the space to do that, right? But that means we also need to be kind of tight and say, okay, if you're trying this and there's no result, if we can't measure any change, if we're not seeing the students are better prepared and students aren't feeling that way, then in that case, we need to, you know, go back and try it again and bring it back together and do something different. So that's what we call that top down, bottom up leadership. From the top down, we're articulating with clarity our core mission, we're holding faculty and staff accountable, we're being explicit about our priorities, but the bottom up approach means that we're improved, if, when improvements don't, we know that improvements won't work without the buy-in. So we're giving the faculty the opportunity to tell us what specifically they need, what are the trends that they're seeing, what are they seeing that their students are asking for, right? So we're looking at that and then we're empowering faculty again to investigate, to learn, Learn, to experiment because we have to be able to do that. So I'm going to get off my soapbox in just a second, but for those who attended my session yesterday know that they could get a free ebook e copy of this, Yark Don't Kill Me. I still have, I think, nine available slots. So if you do want to get a copy of this book and you want to learn how can I lead change and start, you know, in instituting um, learning communities on my campus and start doing that, you can get this book for free um, just by following the link and I'll give it to you just one second. I don't work for Solution Tree. I don't know Robert Eaker in cells personally. I have a stack of books related to learning communities, but when it comes to colleges, this was the one that I found made the most sense because it was really honest about the difference between implementing learning communities in a K-12 campus versus doing so in higher learning campuses because they're not the same. And you can't just take that one process and plop it down and think it's gonna work. And so I really appreciated the honesty in this book and saying, you know, you have to have a different approach. You have to let teachers lead, but you also have to support that. So if you are interested in um, getting a copy of that book, I'm going to pop the link into the chat as soon as I locate it, because I lost my little sticky note here, um, so that you guys can access that. Again, I only have about nine slots available. So the first nine people to fill that form out who did not do so already, I know it was in my session yesterday, I have that list, um, go ahead and follow that link. And if you and you can get a free ebook copy of a new way if you're interested in establishing learning communities. But at the end of the day, um, it's about supporting teachers so that they can better support students. That's what that's about. And so you know, bring the teacher collaboration together, give opportunity to, you know, reduce the amount of time we're wasting on grading and focusing more on learning. I really love that um, Dr. Diaz and Dr. Bloom phrased and framed this work so well this morning. And I'm really happy that I got the opportunity to follow that up, even though there were really big shoes to follow behind. So thank you all so much.
Thank you so much, Sudi. Oh my gosh. I wish I wish I was one of those people, but I'm going to have to pick up a copy of that book because um, I know that the nine are just going to get snatched up right now. Um, I do have a question for you, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A for the entire panel. But the question for you, Sudi, is given how faculty who may be, um, you know, pushing the boundaries, transgressing, as Dr. Diaz said, um, can sometimes feel isolated in making some changes and or maybe be feeling restricted by campus politics, um, you know, the old guard versus the new sometimes, what advice would you give to faculty member, maybe they're untenured or they're new or they're adjunct, who wants to build a community of practice, be in community with others, um, but maybe at an institution that doesn't necessarily have the conditions in place to support that work? Um, what would you say to them? So I would say that to start with small grassroots collaboration, um, you don't have to have it. And the fact is, unfortunately, all campuses aren't where they need to be to foster this collaborative work on a large scale yet. And so you don't have to have this whole huge systemic thing happening. Find a few like minded individuals that want to work on how can we collaborate? How can we support each other to make our own practice better so we can better serve our students? And then just come to the table together. Look at what data you have available and identify identify what additional data you need, identify if you're able to teach so that you can to access that data, right? And so sometimes it just helps to come together with just a small group and you don't even have to be teaching the same thing. Someone asked me this yesterday, like if, if we wanna focus on critical thinking, can we all just come together and think about are we assessing and are we teaching critical thinking properly? And I said, yes, absolutely. If you're teaching different classes, then get a few people together who all wanna focus on the same concept to assure we're all assuring students are, acquiring those concepts, conceptual skills and things of that nature. But yeah, start grassroots, just find a few people that you can come together with. You can be on the same campus, you can be on different campuses, but you can get that peer review and collaboration work going um, from anywhere. Thank you so much. I think you're right. Some of the best movements start grassroots and from the bottom up. And uh, the SLO talks, you know, there's the listserv for SLO. So for those of you who are interested in really doing that work and maybe you're not connected to folks on your campus, join that community um, and definitely start um, reaching out. So at this time, we'd like to open it up for Q&A for the entire panel. And I know Stacy has a, a, she's got a, um, a question there for us. So I'm gonna pass it to Stacy. Great, and one second here, it's trying to add all these spotlights in so everybody can uh, see who is talking. Um, we had a great question from chat and thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. It's been so active. It seems like it is really resonating with a lot of folks today. And we know um, we are so happy that this is getting recorded so it can be shared out even more widely. Um, a question from Sharon um, on, on, uh, on grading. So. They're all for in grading, but our college still requires a letter grade at the end, right? That's the reality of the world that we live in right now. What can we do about that? I know grade are sometimes doesn't show how much my students learn, but if we don't grade, how do we find out if they learn the materials? I think that's for me. <laughs> um, so I also have to give a grade at the end of the semester. So the question is what, why doesn't the grade reflect what the students learned? I mean, we usually, and it, it might vary in, from place to place depending on whether you're teaching somebody else's curriculum or something, but we, it seems to me that if grades mean anything, they should mean what students learned. And if so if there's a sort of mechanistic um, formula for adding things up, you, it needs to come out right. You know, it needs to come out so that it does indicate what students are learning. So what are the problems with the formula and how can you change that? In my own situation, I don't use a formula anymore. I don't have points for anything. I don't add anything up. It's just a kind of global assessment at the end of how much students learned. And we, I do that in conversation with the students. They actually generate the grade, which I may or may not change, but they, they have evidence, they have a portfolio. So they can show me, this is what I did. This is how much I learned about this topic. This is how much I learned about this. This is how I 
um, learned about this genre or what um, Dr. Diaz um, called Diaz, sorry, um, called multiliteracies. You know, this is how I tried an infographic for the first time. This is how I tried a podcast and I learned these skills and I showed that I was grappling with these two units and I put them together and I did this and that's my learning. So when we do all of that, then we do generate a kind of global assessment of what they've learned. And if they stumbled at the beginning, if they didn't turn something in, but they learned, then they learned. And it doesn't sort of matter how they get there. And people have different paths. You know, I, there's something called contract grading, which a lot of people are very excited about, or labor-based grading, um, where it's just about completing assignments. And if you do a certain quantity, then you get a certain grade. And there is a kind of correlation between labor and completion and learning, but it's not mm -hmm. automatic. So portfolios are my preferred method, but it, it, it's just an accumulation like an artist would have of everything they can take with them. And, you know, I don't want to monopolize the conversation here, but one, one of the things that's so beautiful about a portfolio is you can take it and use it to demonstrate what you've learned so that for an employer, for your grandmother, for everybody you want to show, you have this evidence of your learning and it produces pride, it produces excitement, it produces connections outside the classroom, it's more authentic and all of that is so much connected to genuine learning. And so the more we can have that our focus and then use the grade as a kind of final guess, understanding that there is no true objectivity and that this precision is an illusion. And so if you have, you know, a grade of like, I used to agonize over, you know, this person got a 89.7. Should I round up? Should I round down? And that's arbitrary. That's a decision I can make. And so sometimes I might and sometimes I might not. But now that I don't do that, it's much less um, horrifying for me and for the students too. Thank you. I think you put it so well. You're, and it's really capturing that, um, going back to what Yorick was stating this morning, making the invisible, the intangible more tangible, right? Um, to students can actually see and share um, what they've been learning along their whole journey. So I'll turn it over to Libby. Yes, and Dr. Dias, you talk about that, the value of transparency and how important that is. And you've mentioned inching your way, like if someone wants to do this work, they want to do ungrading, they want to you know, change their you know, praxis. What would you say to a faculty member that wants to do this, but is overwhelmed by all the resources that are out there and just doesn't even know where to start? I would say, um, pick one thing in the classroom. One thing you want to do this semester, like you're really interested or curious about how students use social media. Uh, and you know they do, and you check in with them and they all do some kind of social media and you pick that one thing and you bring that in to a piece of the learning that they do. That might be your first step, that's it. And, and what I want to say that actually empowers faculty uh, teachers so much is you should also document the learning, you know, build a portfolio of the students' work because it gives you, it supports you. If somebody actually says, what's all this? You can say, but just look at what they're doing. And that is why they get the grades they do. So you have your evidence as well, you know, and I, and I think uh, Dr. Bloom really put it well, like it is not an objective, precise measure. It's an illusion. At the end of the day, when I give three points or five points, yeah, I don't like that agonizing either. I'm being arbitrary. And, and depending on how I feel, <laughs> I might give, you know, it just, it's absurd. But the evidence of my portfolio of my students learning, that is pretty concrete to say they did this. So I would say take one little thing, bring that into the classroom, try it this semester, see where it goes, then do the next thing. Before you know it, you're in it deep. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Dyes. Stacy, I think you have our next question. Yes, um, we've gotten a question from one of our attendees. Um, Grace asks, how do you ensure the work produced is actually from the student? <laughs> there are resources that, on the internet that help students obtain work. <laughs> I'd like to jump in on that very quickly uh, because I encounter this question a lot. <clears throat> One, if there is a formative process for example, in building a portfolio, it is very hard to cheat um, because you get to see the voice of the student is there. So you know it's who it is. Two, I think it's grading. That, and I think uh, Dr. Bloom can really speak to this. Uh, grading high stakes is what causes that outcome of, I need to go and get something from the internet and I'm gonna copy this, or I'm gonna buy an essay. So I think when we change the game, this might uh, go away a little bit. And when you give students choice and authentic choice and meaningful choice, in 30 something years that I've been working like this, um, cheating has never been a real issue. I, that's exactly right. Um, I, I wrote a book about plagiarism and um, it's, I think it also depends on the assignments. If the assignments are kind of cookie cutter assignments where mm. people can just, you know, write an essay about the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> I mean, you know, who wants to do that? I mean, it's a brilliant address, but, you know, have a comparison between something that happened yesterday in the student's life and something that happened there that isn't a generic kind of assignment. Um, but the other thing is we all consult the internet right? Like, it's not like I write in a vacuum in an empty room with the internet cut off. So what we need to actually help our students figure out what to do is how to use those resources in responsible, ethical, acceptable ways. And so cutting them off from the world that's out there is very arbitrary and artificial and doesn't actually serve them. So but we, it might mean redoing assignments and, you know, having formative um, dimensions, having drafts, having feedback on the drafts, talking about what you can use and in what way. I totally agree. In fact, even just at my level, I'm in a doctoral program. I took um, quantitative reasoning with Dr. David Drew. And for the, I've taken it three other times in my, throughout my academic trajectory, I've never really understood it. I just did enough to get by for the first time in my life. I understood it and was able to like submit something to conference that got accepted. And it was his, his theory was, you know, real study, you know, real researchers, you know, his exams were like, oh, it's totally open notes. It's totally use a calculator. Like in real life, you know, it's not like you're cut off from those things. In real life, you will be referencing these sources to do this work. And so it doesn't make sense for me to assess you in a way that cuts you off from the things you're going to need to do in real life. And I thought, why aren't we teaching all our quantitative reasoning courses mm -hmm. like this across yep. our system? Like somebody please consult with Dr. David Drew. <laughs> but I totally agree. Yes, thank you. Right. Um, my next question is for Sudi, this question is for you. So you talked about sort of the ground up and then the, right, this, just this, all these different ends. Let's say you have an institution that does want to support faculty learning communities. And they're like, gosh, we can't afford to pay everyone to do this. Are there other ways that they can foster this collaboration, right? That let's say doesn't involve stipends or some resource that they may not have a lot of. And also, you know, you know, what would you, how would you, you know, what would you say to these institutions? We're actually working with one, I'm not going to say which college it is, I try not to put people on blast, but we are working with one college that's doing amazing work, but they were trying to get their learning communities going too, and they ran into the same issue in terms of we don't have funding to pay all 62 adjunct faculty in this department to be a part of the community. And so my, my advice to them was, you know, first of all, when you're starting this going in the, to begin with, you don't want to start with 62 people at all, at all, because you don't have buy-in from all 62, right? And so you want to start with volunteers. 
identify your om your collaboration omnivores is what I call them. The people who will always want to come to the table. They always want to work together. They're really excited about doing this work. Identify who those people are. Ask for, you know, who's willing to volunteer to come together, collaborate, and let's get something going. That doesn't mean they have to travel or go anywhere. We can get together on a Zoom meeting and let's have this conversation. They did that. And what they ended up having was two teams, one daytime, one evening team of four teachers who would volunteer to come together and get this collaboration going. What ended up happening, and which has been just eye-opening and exciting for me, is that those four were getting so much stuff done and getting so excited and they're talking to their colleagues like, oh, my, this is what's happening. This is what we came up with. If you want to use this new resource, we found that it's starting to grow and more people are showing up to the meetings. And this is solely voluntary. Um, but one thing, one thing I will say is that the school is looking at and has started investigating how to fund it further so they can get more buy-in. And so they're working on adding that to their budget for next academic year, but they didn't have it this year. And so they said, we want to start this and let's see what we can do. And they got the volunteers and the volunteers were the ones who spread the word and shared the information and the education and got more people to start participating. So just ask, just ask, say, I, we want to hear from you. We want your opinion. We want your advice. We want to collaborate from you. Are you willing to come to the table and see who's willing to be there and put in the work and start doing it? The interesting thing is once, once educators start collaborating, they get excited and they start getting, and they start doing a lot of things. And so it grows pretty rapidly if you give them a chance to lead it themselves and give the, and empower them to do that. Um, but then also let them know these are the steps to come in terms of resources. We don't have it now, but this is what I'm doing to get you what you need next year. And then also, um, supporting whatever types of products that they need additional funding to produce and things of that nature. So if you don't have it now, get some volunteers, but plan for how can I add funding to this later? I love that you said that. I also, it's almost like a callback to earlier when we talked about, um, you know, you might want to think about bringing the union to the table, you know, working under the existing structures that we have may not be the answer. We might have to dismantle the structures we have and build new ones that facilitate all of this, right? So this could even, you know, addressing the issue about the class sizes, teaching load, all of those things. So I just, I love that you said that. Thank you so much. I know, Stacey, you, have, you might have a, a question for us. Yes, another um, question has popped in from our attendees, um, this time really focusing on what we are all experiencing right now, right, with the pandemic and then online um, and sometimes asynchronous environment in which we are actually trying to teach. So um, Catherine is wondering if our panelist group could share your thoughts on how to accomplish some of this on grading, focus on individualized learning in this asynchronized uh, online environment, and or if we should be advocating to control this rapid spread of online only instruction. So a couple of things, a few things to tackle there. Thanks, Catherine, for that question, but I'll turn it over to our panelists. Um, I'll, I'll jump in on the uh, online, this, this whole idea of the online space and asynchronous, synchronous things. I can't wait to get back into a physical classroom because I just love being there in my whole body. Um, you know, and I'm really trying to figure out how embodied learning happens in an online space. But having said that, the online space actually is a really good uh, uh, environment to really think about um, opening up the learning. You know, it has so disrupted education that I think it also has opened up and disrupted the conditioned ways that both students and teachers think. You know, we, we go to school from the age of, you know, six or something, and we get conditioned into that system. So I would say that this is an opportunity for us if we can be intentional. Um, I think, for example, the use of portfolios, um, the bringing in, oh, by the way, I love single point rubrics is what I, I use. The using of a different type of rubric, the idea of co-creating things with students in an online space where you say, okay, let's, let's face it, this is not an easy space. How shall we go about this journey? I feel like the shifts that we have to make that I'm making now is talking to our students very explicitly about the process of learning and about the difficulties of learning online. And it has forced us, I love this with assessment, it has forced us to not think about always jumping to closed book timed exams because proctoring software, surveillance, cost, whatever, it just doesn't work. 
And I can't tell you the number of faculty in my institution who are really for the first time in their long teaching career have started to think, what is a different way to write a question that allows open book, open web, peer collaboration, talk to people. And it's what you said, Dr. Bloom, in our real lives, we don't work like this. Why are we still testing like this? So there is a lot more work to do. And I think uh, one last thing I wanna say is I feel like that I've noticed in my institution, a big gap between the work we put out in the asynchronous space with no connection to the work that we do in this classroom. So if we do have an asynchronous module, how does it come into the classroom? And I feel that where it's done successfully, teaching is more like workshopping. It's becoming that. So uh, that's my two cents worth. Yeah, I, I, th I think um, we have never had as many national conversations about teaching as we mm -hmm. have in the last 12 months. Um, it's been extraordinary. And you know, I've been teaching, as I said, remotely since March, and it's been really hard. Um, there are all these discussions about synchronous and asynchronous dimensions of classes and equity and access and the digital divide and who has cameras and who doesn't. And all of that has really forced us to think about what are our goals and how do we get there? And, you know, if a student doesn't turn on their camera, what does that mean? You know, if does it mean they're in a parking lot using the Wi-Fi from the library? Does it mean that they're in an apartment with 12 people? Does it mean that their Wi-Fi signal isn't strong enough for the video and the audio? Does it mean that they're bored, you know, that they didn't do the work? It's it's hard to interpret that. And so I think this whole moment has given us you know, it's forced everybody to really think about the affordances of some of what we can do better online and some of what we miss. And certainly I miss many things, <laughs> I, but we've, it's also really revealed the inequities and the diverse backgrounds of all of our learners, mm -hmm. which we've, it's been easier to gloss over them when you kind of see all the people in front of you in the room, because they've, at least the ones who come, have shown up and you kind of see them as students in a row. But now we, we're really aware of all the differences. I want to quickly say something piggybacking with that. I think what you've touched on is very important that it's forcing us to think about trust and connection in the classroom. When someone isn't switching on their videos, do we jump to an assumption? Just like with participation, if they're not speaking, are they not engaged? And it is about trust and relationships now. Uh, and it, online space, interestingly, is maybe humanizing the teaching in some ironic way. <laughs> I want to put on a different hat very briefly. Um, I'm also a distance learning coach and Yark and I were talking back in the spring and I was like, when we were trying to plan an SLO webinar, I was like, I'm really popular right now. So let me come back to you later. <laughs> but one of the things I do want to say, and I want to address the last part of that question, which is, should we slow down the trajectory? We, I don't think we can. I'm just being very honest. Mm -hmm. I, the way that we do education now has shifted. We we had a huge, large swath of educators who just were very averse to distance and blended learning. They didn't want to do it. They wanted to stick with being in the classroom. And unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, at this point, it's there's no longer an excuse to say we can't do distance learning. But with that being said, that doesn't mean distance learning and online education is right for every student and that every student thrives that way. We have way too much research, research telling us at this point that some students are really struggling and some students are doing really, really well. And so I think what we're going to have to look at is meeting students where they are after this ends and making sure that we're offering education in a way that we're serving the needs of all students. Um, distance learning does add an, an aspect of equity to our education offerings because it gives students who can't get to the classroom otherwise a way to get there. However, when we are forced 100% online, we create another equity issue with the, in terms of of the digital divide, right? And so we have to be willing to investigate all of these things. But if you're trying to identify, are my students engaging? Are my students you know, doing really well? Utilize the built-in tools in your learning management systems. There are so many logs and resources and ways for you 
to see, did my student, where did my student get stuck? Where did they spend the most amount of time? Where, what can I tap? And then utilize exactly what Dr. Diaz says, those online portfolios, utilize these other ways of doing things besides just, you know, clicking a multiple choice and, you know, typing a long essay. There's so many activities and things that we can do online to assure our students are learning. But I think we need to be prepared for the fact that, and I'm, as much as I love tech, I hate working from home. I'm not going to lie. I can't stand it. I want to be back in my office. I want to be around with my friends, right? But we do have to be pre prepared to do some level of online learning and continuing that go going moving forward because we know that for some students that works really well and we don't want to leave them behind. Oh my gosh, such good stuff. I wish we I, I wish we could just do this forever, every day. I, I would meet with you every day. Um, but I know it's not possible and we're about to go to break. So I just want to ask each of our panelists, what final takeaway would you give or piece of advice to each of our attendees who want to envision themselves as learning leaders? Hmm. For me, I will say, this is hard to do given all the hard questions. But if you can keep a grounding in joy and courage for teaching, you will have hard questions. Things won't go away, but you will move forward because joy and courage is teaching means you want to bring that to learning and that you care about all learners learning. That's my grounding that I'll share. Um. Why are we in this in the first place? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? And how do we get there in ways that align with the big goals? And how can we be on the same side as our students and get them to where they want to go in a way that has, I think, joy and also meaning? And um, I, I believe that all people deserve to um, be respected and move forward and have goodwill. And so how can we foster that in our practices, in our interactions and in our structures? So that helps me. I would just say to people who are um, looking to be leaders um, in, in this movement is what, if, if you will, of shifting education to be more student focused, right? To just share. When you learn something new, share it. If you're struggling with something, share it because someone else can help you. If you did really well, share it. Celebrate those small wins. When your students are doing really great, share that. Make sure they know they're doing really great. But the big thing here is just to share. Be a collaborator in your classrooms with your students. Build those sense of of those communities within the classrooms, build those communities outside the classroom and share whether it's the good, the bad, the ugly, because we're all going through this together. And when we're honest with what's happening, we can hold hands and work together and do better and make and make the situation a little better. So share what you know, share what you're struggling with and allow people to help you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, <laughs> Stacy and I are boys.